Okay, I started the recording. So let's start. It's sharp. That's it's six o'clock uh, UK time now. So uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, sorry, let me go back to the first slide. Okay. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, if you're actually joining us uh, from the UK and good day if you're uh, with us from any other uh, parts of the world. Uh, actually, we expect to have people uh, from uh, 20 countries as registration. Uh, and let's see how many people will join uh, eventually. Uh, my name is uh, Human Takhtechian and I'm a uh, current i Aberdeen branch uh, chair. Uh, welcome to our October uh, technical program, one of our uh, monthly evening uh, presentation and talks. Uh, please note that this uh, webinar is uh, recorded and uh, it will be later after this uh, session available on our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, also, please note that uh, if you have any question, uh, uh, you can ask during the presentation in the uh, Q&A box. Uh, please don't ask in the uh, chat box because it probably will be missed. Uh, so please ask them in the question section. Uh, Dr. Ole, uh, our vice chair, uh, he will go through the questions after the presentation uh, finished. Uh, so as you have already seen from the event flyer. Uh, today's presentation is by Dr. Cheng uh, from the University of Calgary, all the way from Canada. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cheng, for joining. Uh, the topic is uh, internal corrosion of pipelines, mechanism, modeling, and uh, management. Uh, he's uh, covering some fundamentals of internal corrosion mechanism. Uh, in uh, pipelines and the factors affecting them based on the academic and industrial uh, experience in uh, that region. Uh, but uh, before I invite uh, Dr. Chang uh, for his presentation, I would like to give you a brief summary of ICOR Aberdeen upcoming uh, programs. And uh, this way we'll give uh, a few minutes to, to others who uh, hasn't that they haven't joined yet. Uh, so first of all, I would like to thank all our branch sponsors uh, who have kindly supported us uh, regularly. And uh, this has uh, enabled us to keep all our uh, monthly meetings happening without any gap for the last several years. We really appreciate that. Uh, also, I would like to thank our Aberdeen branch committee members, uh, all uh, working on a voluntary basis, uh, supporting uh, the branch and myself in arranging the events uh, uh, or monthly events or uh, annual corrosion forum and uh, other programs that are uh, running at the moment or upcoming events for, for the next year. Uh, without them, actually, we, we couldn't uh, uh, have all of this uh, program happening uh, regularly. Uh, this is the list of our committee members of 14 people uh, that we have at the moment uh, uh, in various positions. If, if you have any queries, uh, if you want uh, more information or uh, uh, anything related to the previous uh, webinars, coming, uh, upcoming webinars, courses, and so on, please feel free to contact uh, any of us uh, uh, through ICOR Aberdeen uh, email address uh, or uh, LinkedIn uh, or myself uh, or uh, maybe Oli uh, who is in, in, in the call at the moment as well. Uh, as I said, uh, the Events are recorded and uh, they will be uploaded on our, our uh, YouTube channel. You can see that there are uh, previous uh, events uh, recordings available. You can watch them, uh, go back and watch them uh, as well. 
and also all the slides uh, back to, I don't know when, maybe 2012, uh, they were already available on our website uh, year by year, all the presentations, even uh, photo galleries and so on, uh, they are available and you can, you can uh, read through them. Uh, the next year program, you should have already received that by email. Uh, uh, if not, uh, please ask, we can, we can send you uh, by email. So the next uh, month program is a joint meeting with IOM3 MIS uh, by Dr. Nigel Owen uh, Aberdeen from Aberdeen Foundries uh, about the sacrificial anodes, material selection and design and manufacturing. Uh, so there, there is a full program until the uh, end of the year, and uh, the last one will end at uh, May 2022. Uh, and uh, a major uh, event happening next year that I want to uh, announce it again uh, here uh, is our Young Engineer Program 2022 happening from January until November next year. Uh, if you are interested to participate in that, please contact myself or uh, any of the committee members. Uh, uh, this is uh, happening for the first time in Aberdeen, uh, but I have to mention that is only uh, uh, applicable for the Aberdeen uh, young engineers to, to attend that because we are trying to have uh, uh, half of the sessions at least face-to-face uh, -face in Aberdeen. So uh, there it uh, consists of uh, about nine to 10 uh, lectures, monthly lectures from January. Uh, and uh, we will have uh, our final, uh, we will have a case study released to, to the participant in, in May. Uh, and then uh, they can have the case study presented at the end of the year, November next year. Uh, the case study will be presented in front of the panel of judges and then uh, the winning uh, team or group will be awarded uh, the travel and accommodation to attend NACE uh, conference uh, or AMPP, uh, formerly known as NACE conference in 2023. 20, uh, uh, so uh, the course, as I mentioned, is, is free of charge to attend, uh, thanks to our sponsors. Uh, include uh, various aspects of the uh, corrosion engineering material, cutting protection, welding, coating, and so on. Uh, we are expecting to have 20 participants maximum. Uh, so these will be carefully selected uh, and will be grouped in five teams. We have uh, one mentor per team and the mentors are selected from uh, technical managers or uh, leaders in, in the industry. Uh, mentoring the team, uh, the, the groups uh, throughout the whole course. Uh, so if you are interested as a young engineer to attend, please let us know. Uh, there is a full presentation on this program, a one hour presentation that we did a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it is also available on our YouTube channel. You can go and watch that and understand, uh, learn more about the, the program details. Uh, and how to apply uh, the forms for the application and, and so on. If you are interested to uh, support as a mentor or as a speaker in one of these uh, uh, topics or as a sponsor, uh, please uh, uh, contact myself uh, and I can explain uh, the opportunities. And uh, uh, that's all. Uh, we already have 47 attendees, which is good uh, for the start of the presentation. Uh, so before I ask Dr. Chang to uh, start the, his talk, uh, I will run a poll, uh, which he has actually uh, designed the question uh, for half a minute, maybe. Uh, so please uh, read through that and uh, answer. Uh, it's about uh, who is who was named as the father of modern corrosion science and engineering. And there are uh, four choices available. 
So let's see who gets the right answer. Already 20 people answered. That's quite a clever question, Dr. Chang, because I can see that the, the answers are very close. Thirty people answered. Okay, I will wait for another ten seconds. Okay, I think that's everybody. Thirty-three people answered, and I will release the results. Okay, so it seems forty-two percent of people selected Purve, thirty-six people Havens, twelve percent Hor, and nine percent Fontana. So I will leave it for Dr. Chang to give me the uh, right answer. Uh, so and you can share your screen. I will stop sharing. Okay, so I can share my computer, right? Yes, yeah. Okay, okay. So right now you can see my computer okay, right? Yes, if you go to the presentation mode, yeah. Okay. That's good. great, yes. That's good. So uh, my voice is good, right? Yes, that's that's perfect. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, let's start. Uh, First, with so the answer to the question. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. So uh, depending which country uh, you are currently stay, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Icar Abdin Branch, to organize this uh, excellent opportunity, uh, so that I have. Uh, uh, have the chance to have uh, such a very good uh, communication. And uh, firstly, I want to release the answer to the poll questions. And uh, the father of the modern coaching science of uh, and engineering uh, actually is uh, uh, Evans. So Professor Evans is a professor of the University of Cambridge. And he published the book, uh, Corrosion of Metals in 1923. And uh, this is the first book uh, to develop the theory and uh, all the science and the engineering about the corrosion. So that's uh, Professor Evans was named the father of the modern corrosion science and engineering. All right, uh, today uh, I will talk about the internal corrosion of pipelines. Uh, just give me a second, I just uh, monitor my time. Okay, so this research uh, has been conducted in my group uh, over 10 years. And uh, there are many students and staffs uh, get involved in this research. At the same time, I appreciate the support uh, from the Canadian government and also the local oil, gas and the pipeline industry. Uh, I believe uh, many of you probably has visited Calgary before. And for those uh, who have, have not have a chance to visit the Calgary. So please permit me uh, have a one minute to introduce where I am. So that's the map of Canada, it's a big country. So in the west side, there is a province, Alberta. Uh, and uh, Calgary is located in the south part of the province. So this is the uh, center of the oil, gas and the pipeline industry. So from Calgary, to Vancouver to the west, uh, 950 kilometers. 
and to the east to Toronto is 2,700 kilometers. So it's a very big country. So Calgary is the fourth largest city in Canada. So the total population is over 1.4 million. And uh, the important logo for Calgary uh, is uh, recognized as a center of international oil, gas, and the pipeline industry. Uh, I, want, I always include these slides in my presentation. And uh, from Calgary, uh, if you drive about one hour to the west, uh, you will be a uh, Banff National Park. So that's a uh, uh, it's an amazing place and uh, very uh, wonderful and uh, time for your family and for vacation. So currently, uh, I'm doing a research in pipeline corrosion, uh, pipeline integrity, and energy transmission technology at the University of Calgary. And uh, I want to introduce uh, three books I have authored and uh, published the stress corrosion cracking of pipeline uh, in 2007. Uh, 2003, sorry, uh, 2007, sorry. And uh, the second book is a pipeline coating uh, published in uh, 2017 and the AC corrosion of pipelines as uh, published uh, this year in 2021. All right, so uh, when we talk about the pipelines and of course I will uh, name myself as a pipeline researcher and the uh, pipeline has played an important role in transportation of uh, Oil gas. So even we are target the energy transition and to achieve the net zero by 2050. But you can see from the forecast, and the natural gas still can play an important role in the uh, energy by 2050. At the same time, we still need the oil, and uh, so the pipelines are uh, hoped to still continue to play an important role for oil gas transmission. At the same time. The pipeline also proposed for transportation of the new energy, such as hydrogen or biogas or supercritical CO2 for CCUIs. And uh, even we have some report, pipeline are regarded as a critical contributor to the net zero target achievement. So as a pipeline researcher, and uh, I think we still have many things to do. Uh, when I introduce the pipelines, and firstly, uh, let's uh, uh, look at and uh, which type of pipelines uh, you're focusing. Currently, uh, I will mean for the oil gas as an example. And uh, you can see from this slide, and uh, in the upstream from the oil and the gas wells and going to the upstream processing plant. And we call this part is a gas in pipelines. And the gas in pipeline has a very different features and a different environment compared with the non-distance transmission pipelines. After the oil gas is pro uh, processed, and they will be transported by pipeline across province, across countries, over hundreds or thousands of kilometers. So that's the uh, transmission pipelines. And uh, to the oil refinery, for example. So the gas and the uh, support or cooking and heating and going to the building and it's distributed by the distribution pipelines. So today, and my talk will focus on the upstream gasoline pipelines. And the reason I want to uh, uh, clarify which pipeline sectors, and the reason is the uh, environment and operating condition for different sectors of pipelines are quite different. As a result, the corrosion and will be very, very different. Internal corrosion is the most important mechanism to cause the failure of the upstream pipelines. So this is a, a performance statistics uh, for the pipelines uh, operating in the province of Alberta. And the report was issued by AER, Alberta Energy Regulator. So you can see from this data, uh, in 2019, there are 46% of the pipeline incidents and caused by internal corrosion. So this is a significant. And uh, of course, internal corrosion is very critical. It's highly related to the internal environment of the pipeline to carry the fluid, oil or gas or fluid. But if we talk about the transmission, and I think the data will be totally different. And uh, 
The reason is pretty clear. The oil gas transported in the long distance has been processed. So the environment, the environment will be uh, internal environment will be very different from the upstream pipelines. So internal corrosion of pipelines and uh, please, this is upstream pipelines is very complicated. And uh, when we talk about the internal corrosion in terms of the mechanism and uh, the uh, technical to control the problem and uh, the industrial management and uh, strategic, uh, strategic measures. And we have to look at and understand the problem. That's the first step. Internal corrosion of pipelines involved multiple factors and will influence the problem at the same time. So you can see from this slide, I list a couple of different uh, factors and uh, the factors from the fluid chemistry, such as the CO2, H2S partial pressure, solution chemistry or pH and uh, organic acid, oil phase solid particles. So they will influence the internal corrosion. At the same time, the operating conditions such as the temperature pressure and the fluid hydrodynamics and also the pipe geometry such as the pipe size and the inclination angles, all of them will influence the process. So when we try to control this problem, and I think it's very critical, we include all the factors together and into your management program. Okay, and uh, if we want to understand the internal corrosion as a problem, and firstly, we want to recognize how the internal corrosion happens. And the first thing you can see, and for internal corrosion of pipelines to happen, there must be a couple different chemical reactions and get involved. I use the CO2 as an example, and the CO2 gas must be dissolved in the water to form the different chemical species. And these species will, through the mass transport, and also based on the electrochemical reaction to change the solution chemistry and the pH and the other conditions to influence the corrosion process. So all of them is the chemical reactions. For corrosion to happen, there are also multiple electrochemical reactions to happen. Electrochemical reaction means this reaction will involve the exchange of a charge and carried by electrons in the metal and the charged chemicals in the liquid phase. For example, we have the cathodic reaction, such as the hydrogen evolution or reduction of the acid, the reduction of the carbonate, and even reduction of water. So we will discuss this reaction a little bit later. At the same time, the steel will also experience a different anodic reaction. So this is the oxidation of the metal, such as Fe will become the Fe2 plus and produce electrons. And the Fe can also become oxidized by the coupling different uh, reactions. So this uh, chemical and the electrochemical reaction will directly cause corrosion of the steel. At the same time, at the same time, the corrosion, internal corrosion will also involve the film formation. And uh, for example, in CO2 environment, and it depends on the temperature and the CO2 partial pressure and other factors, the iron carbonate scale can be formed and deposit on the steel surface and to change the further corrosion rate. So if we include the H2S into the corrosive environment and the CO2 corrosion and the H2S corrosion will compete each other depends on the operating conditions such as the CO2 and the H2S partial pressure. So that's a continue to complicate it the corrosion environment and the corrosion situation. So this is uh, all of them actually, and uh, probably will happen, depends on the different uh, conditions. We need uh, to know which are uh, candidate reactions potentially happen in the internal corrosion environment. Okay, and uh, the first step, if we want to understand the internal corrosion problem, and we need to understand the corrosion thermodynamics. So to be briefly, the thermodynamics just simply answer the question under the given condition, what are the corrosion reaction? And is the corrosion possible or not possible? So this is a thermodynamic question. So given condition, 
and uh, it's a reference to temperature, pressure, fluid flow, chemical uh, solution chemistry, pH, and et cetera. So, and uh, in order to understand the corrosion and the control corrosion, and uh, firstly, we need to develop a thermal dynamic model and uh, to firmly determine under the given condition, what are the real reactions will happen under the condition. So because the corrosion involved in the chemical reaction and the electrochemical reaction, to develop the thermal dynamics model, we need to calculate the reaction constant, and we need to calculate the electrical potential under the given condition, and then to have the prediction, what are the potential reaction under the given condition. Okay, so let's look at this example. And this is a thermal dynamic model developed in my group, and we focus on the CO2 corrosion. So you can see from this uh, slide, and uh, under the given temperature and uh, uh, pressure, and uh, based on the different concentration of the organic acid, HAC is a short term of a typical organic acid, uh, that's uh, uh, acidic acid. And uh, depends on the different concentration. So you can see we have a multiple cathodic reaction and the multiple anodic reaction potentially happen. So if we're under the certain concentration of HAC and based on the major potential of the steel, we can determine under the given condition, such as uh, if HAC is 1000 ppm, for example, under the given condition in our system, the cathodic reaction is just uh, this one and this one and this potentially will happen. So what are the potential cathodic reaction? And we look here and you can see the iron and the carbonate potentially can form the iron carbonate by, by this reaction. And uh, this one corresponding to the iron and the bicarbonate to form the iron carbonate scale by this reaction. So uh, this is another reaction, sorry. For the cathodic, and we look at the reaction with the net negative potential compared with the modular value. So you can see we have a multiple cathodic reaction in the graph B. And uh, you can read from the label here, and uh, we have the multiple uh, cathodic reaction we must include in the, in the model or in the uh, management uh, uh, strategy. So this one just uh, very simply tell us and the uh, internal corrosion depends on mining conditions. So when we determine the conditions such as the temperature, pressure, pH, and the zone, we need to determine which cathodic reaction and which anodic reaction will happen. So in this way, we just uh, can eliminate those reactions that does, with it will not happen under the condition. And then we will focus on the reaction potentially happen in the system. And then we take the measure to control this reaction. So this is the purpose. We need to develop the thermodynamic model as a first step. Okay, after we determine which reaction potentially happen under the given condition, the next step, we need to go to the, what's the corrosion rate? So that's the second step. And the CO2 corrosion, for example, your CO2X example, corrosion kinetics. So what's the rate of the internal corrosion? So to determine the internal corrosion rate, and uh, one of the most important uh, condition will be fluid hydrodynamics. Because the fluid is flowing in the pipelines, and that's why we need to set up a certain vicinity to simulate or it's better to reproduce the fluid mechanics condition applied on the pipe. So in order to reproduce the condition, and uh, you can see from this graph, I produce, uh, make a steel sample, make the sample become part of the pipe segment. So in this way, the fluid and is flowing on the surface of the sample and try to reproduce the fluid mechanics condition. So some people just uh, uh, install a coupon in the loop. Uh, it's okay, but uh, compare with this kind of the sample and when you place a coupon and the surface of the coupon, may not have the same fluid mechanics condition with the pipe segment. So that's why we make the sample to be part of the pipe and under the identical 
fluid mechanics condition. So let's look at the results. And uh, in order to measure the corrosion rate, and uh, we use uh, electrochemical technique to measure the polarization curve and the electrochemical impedance. So if some of you are not quite familiar with uh, these two techniques, I just simply say, these two techniques can quickly give you what are the corrosion rate. At the same time, we can also tell how the fluid conditions will influence the corrosion process. So for example, you can see when we increase the fluid velocity and we found this is a negative potential at, uh, referred to the cathodic and the polarization behavior. Increase the fluid velocity will increase the mass transfer of corrosive species. As a consequence, it will increase the corrosion rate. At the same time, the increase the fluid velocity also increase the corrosion rate. The uh, indicator is a decreased and impedance and related to the corrosion resistance. At the same time, we can also measure how the different temperature will influence these two techniques results and try to correlate the temperature with the corrosion process. So anyhow, so this slide just tell us the pipe fluid loop is critical for internal corrosion research and the major the internal corrosion rate. And about everybody knows the pipe is not always the straight pipe. Sometimes the pipe will go up or going down with a different inclinations angles. So that's why we also need to develop a different vicinity to simulate the when the pipe is inclination upward and downward. And the sample, the steel pipe and the fluid may and the different uh, impingement angles. So this angle will influence the corrosion, that's for sure. And uh, you can see, and uh, by develop this kind of the impingement jet vicinity, at the same time, we combine with uh, um, uh, 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 a fluid uh, stress modeling. And uh, when we see the fluid and the impingement as a normal angle or different uh, impingement angles, and the shear stress on the steel sample will be quite different. Does it will influence the corrosion? The answer is yes. And uh, you can see one, two, three, four, five, seven is a sample installed with a different position relative to the fluid. And uh, they, of course, have the different corrosion rate. And uh, this is a direct evidence. And when the fluid mechanics condition are different, corrosion rate will be influenced significantly. And why is that? The same thing, a direct evidence, you can see the sample on the different position relative to the fluid will have a very different morphology of the corrosion products. So corrosion products from the in situ environment will be somewhat protective to the further corrosion. Of course, depends on the structure of the products. At the same time, we also measure the impedance of different samples and we found very clearly when the sample are located in the different location and the impedance of the steel will be quite different. And uh, I just take an example, which one have a very small impedance that's indicated the high corrosion rate. So you can see the triangle is the smallest the semicircle, that's the smallest resistance. So a triangle is the number three sample. So number three sample is right here. And it's not 90 degree relative to the fluid, but it's uh, uh, roughly is about 60 or 70 degree. So this area will experience the highest corrosion rate. So the reason the number three will experience the highest corrosion and it's, it's influenced by both fluid hydrodynamics condition and also depends on the corrosion reaction. But anyhow, so, and we have to, to do something, to simulate something. And uh, uh, when the fluid and the pipe with uh, different angles, we, we have the vicinity and to simulate the fluid hydrodynamic condition and then to measure the corrosion. And uh, for the upstream pipeline, and of course the fluid will, influence, uh, will include the oil phase. So oil is a hydrocarbons. 
and the hydrocarbon actually is an inhibitor, right? Is an inhibitor. So if the oil and the liquid, uh, such as water, has a competition and uh, touch it on the steel surface, and the corrosion could be going down or going up. So it depends on the competition of the absorption or, and the oil and the water. So based on this background, and we also perform the uh, research and the measurement and to include the different concentration of oil in the fluid. And uh, we can see, and uh, also based on the polarization curve and the impedance measurements, the oil addition really can change the corrosion rate. And uh, uh, it's uh, indicated by the increase of the oxidation current and the change of the impedance. At the same time, we also develop a model and uh, to simulate the mass transfer precise and the charge transfer precise and uh, to uh, predict the uh, relationship between the corrosion current density. This one can be converted to the corrosion rate. And uh, when the oil, uh, when the fluid includes a different concentration of the oil. So, but anyhow, and uh, so oil phase can be uh, served as an inhibitor. So that's why we try to simulate the inhibitive influence of the oil phase. For internal corrosion, and uh, another important factor will be uh, erosion, right? So if the fluid also carry <clears throat> the solid particles such as uh, orga inorganic sand, the erosion corrosion or erosion uh, influence on corrosion will be significant. So you can see from this graph and when the fluid carries a different concentration of the sand or impingement on the pipe steel with different angles, and the particle impingement is pretty clear. So in this way, we try to uh, 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 split the contribution of the erosion and the corrosion or erosion enhanced the corrosion or corrosion enhanced the erosion and uh, to the total weight loss. At the same time, the corrosion measurements supposed to be combined with the stress simulation, try to understand how the shear stress and the normal stress will influence the corrosion process. So if the sand are included in the fluid and uh, it's important to determine to, and to separate the, uh, the contributions of the corrosion part and the erosion part to the total weight loss. And of course, it's depending on the sand concentration and the impingement angle and other, uh, other different conditions. So that's why the erosive impact of the particles and the supposed to be a one important factor to understand the internal corrosion. Okay, so next important factor I mentioned uh, uh, in the beginning is organic acid. So organic acid is always included in the upstream fluid in the pipelines. For example, if we use uh, acetic acid as an example to be uh, included in the fluid, so when the acid is added and it will change the corrosion distribution on the pipe steel surface, at the same time, this acid will break and destroy the iron carbonate scale on the surface. So if the scale is broken because of the acid attack and it will cause the no collateral corrosion. So that's one of the reason and the internal corrosion can suffer from the local peaking to cause a pipeline leaking. So that's uh, because of the local breakdown of the iron carbonate scale by the organic acid. But the most important reason, we also evidence the internal leaking of the pipeline for the upstream and actually is the peaking corrosion and the scale. So no matter, I, I will realize the iron carbonate scale in some cases is protective depends on the temperature and it depends on the structure. But uh, this scale and uh, cannot always guarantee is 100% compact. So for example, and we use uh, test, for example, the X65 pipe steel and the corrode in the oil field formation water, we purge with 100% uh, CO2, that's lots of CO2 as a 60 degree, we still found the iron carbonate scale is not so compact. Why is that? Because we scan the resistance 
on the scale surface. We do find as some area, the, uh, this is the impedance related to the resistance. We do find as some area, the scale has a holes and a pulse. It's a feature with a decreased impedance. And uh, of course, the structure of the scale will improve this structure. Depends on the corrosion time. If the time is going up, and you can see from the uh, morphology and uh, the uh, structure will be improved. But if some of the uh, local defects is included and the scale part and the de uh, defect will form a galvanic infect. So the galvanic infect actually will cause a quick groaning of a pitting corrosion as a local defects area. So, and uh, this is a major reason we can see the internal leaking of the pipeline in the upstream condition. The reason is uh, local breakdown of the uh, iron carbonate scale to cause a localized pitting corrosion. The reason is the uh, galvanic copy effect between the scale part and the defect part. So in addition to the pitting corrosion and the scale, and actually the local pitting can also happen under the sand bank. So you know in Alberta, uh, most of the oil re uh, reserve is oil sand. So the upstream fluid includes a high concentration of the sands in organic sand. So because the sand is heavy, because of the gravity, the sand will tend to deposit and settle down on the pipe bottom. So we do find from the field and also from the laboratory simulation, pitting corrosion can happen at the sand bank. To research and to determine the pitting rate. And in this case, we need to uh, prepare some of the micro probe and to insert into the space between sand particles and to measure the pitting rate. At the same time, we also need to model how the pitting time strip will influence the pitting corrosion rate. So this is a special situation and the pitting corrosion and the deposit sand bed. So that's in Alberta, we do have this problem. Okay, so the last important uh, uh, fundamental problem in internal corrosion is the cost back bacteria. So you can see in oil gas industry, the microbial corrosion cost about 40% of all internal corrosion events in pipelines. No matter is the offshore pipelines or uh, inland pipelines and the microbial corrosion really exist. And so that's why when we talk about the internal corrosion, and uh, please don't forget the corrosion caused by the bacteria. So, and uh, internal microbial corrosion usually happen under the deposit. This deposit actually in the oil pipelines actually is a mixture of the petroleum sludge and the inorganic sand and the water and the corrosion products, of course, and mixed with the bacteria. So this local environment will form a unique environment to grow the microbial population, finally to cause the microbial corrosion. And uh, this deposit, actually you can see at the same time, at one hand, it will support the growth of the bacteria population. At the same time, this deposit can also block the supply of the nutrition to feed this bacteria. So when we talk about the internal microbial corrosion and the deposit, and uh, to reproduce the deposit in the laboratory is uh, very critical. But the internal microbial corrosion in the gas pipeline is very different because the natural gas pipeline is featured with the water condensation on the pipe surface due to the temperature difference between inside and outside pipelines. So if the bacteria grew in the very thin layer of the water condensate, so that will be a competition of the biofilm and the corrosion product film. So biofilm will support corrosion and the corrosion product film will control corrosion. So that depends on the competition of the two infects for the internal uh, natural gas microbial corrosion. So if you want to study and uh, try to measure the internal microbial corrosion in the gas pipelines, and uh, you need to think about the competition of the two infects.
from the biofilm and from the corrosion products. Okay, so I talk about uh, lots of the slides and the knowledge related to the internal corrosion. The reason, and of course, it's for the academic research and to improve our knowledge in this area. But from the industrial side and the fundamental understanding will be helpful for what? For develop different models. So the very reliable model is very critical for the ICDA, Internal Corrosion Direct Assessment. So this is a very effective strategy to manage internal corrosion. So it depends on the ICDA and the industry will have the different procedure and the, but the important part of the ICDA program is try to use a model and uh, uh, combine with the indirect or even direct inspection and uh, try to improve the assessment reliability. Finally, and the uh, industry can depend on the ICDA for internal corrosion management. So that's why the model is very critical. So for the internal corrosion model, uh, there are a couple of different types. And the first the type I introduced with you is a CFD model and the computational fluid dynamics model. Use the fluid mechanical parameter and uh, to predict the corrosion. Because what? Because you just say internal corrosion actually is closely related to the fluid flow. And uh, this slide just showing you an example. And it depends on the different fluid uh, velocity and the different composition of the oil and the water in the fluid. And we can use a CFD model to predict where the water will be easily attached on the steel surface. So if the pipe steel is wetted by the oil, we don't worry because the corrosion will not happen in the oil. So only when the water face wet the pipe steel, corrosion is possible. So this model, the first function is just a prediction of the location of the water whitening the pipe steel. So this one will combine with the fluid mechanical condition simulation and the modeling. So after the model is developed and we try to correlate CR is the corrosion rate with the hydrodynamic condition. For example, the shear stress or pressure gradient and this one will be related to the corrosion rate based on the empirical constants. So you can say this model, and uh, uh, I will say is mostly is an empirical model because the fluid mechanical parameter is the only consideration related to the corrosion reaction. But of course we know it's more than fluid mechanics, right? But in most the situation, this model and still are reliable. You can see the comparison of model the corrosion rate with the major corrosion rate in the field and in the one type of the oil and the consistency actually is good. And in order to prove the reliability of CF model, we also change a different oil with a different properties and also perform the same comparison. The modeling and the real measured value actually have a very good consistency. So if under the given condition, if you under the condition very well, you set up the corrosion mechanism. And uh, you can see from this compare reason, we can use the fluid mechanics parameter to predict the corrosion rate. And uh, it's relatively, is very reliable. So that's the first half of the model, depends on the fluid mechanics. The second model for internal corrosion prediction is a water chemistry model. Water chemistry is try to calculate the solution pH. Because in mining situation, especially in CO2 and H2S dissolved water, the pH is very critical for the corrosion. So of course, the internal environment is very complicated. If you want to calculate the final pH of the solution, and you can see here, and you need to think about lots of different input conditions, such as the temperature, partial pressure, total pressure, the fluid chemistry, and you need to calculate the different chemical reactions and the rate constant to determine the concentration of different chemical species. Finally, you got the concentration of H plus and calculate the solution pH. So this is a procedure and uh, to determine the pH 
And uh, this is a key to water chemistry model. Okay, after the water chemistry model is developed, we can calculate the steel corrosion rate based on the solution pH. So these slides are showing you how reliable the water chemistry model compare with the experimental data. So based on the compare reason of the model the pH and the measured pH, and it depends on the different partial pressure of say, uh, CO2 or different uh, solution chemistry and uh, uh, performed by the experimentally performed by different groups and in the world. But uh, basically, uh, basically you can see the consistency between the model the pH and the real major the pH uh, relatively is good. And uh, uh, the compare reason of the model with these uh, black dots, you can see by this group people have uh, certain errors. And uh, so that's a problem will cause by the different uh, in, uh, experimental condition. But uh, basically the modeling pH uh, can, give, uh, can give the relative reliable prediction of the real measured value. And then we can use the pH for the corrosion rate prediction. And uh, this is a compare reason based on the solution pH for the corrosion rate prediction and uh, compare with the major corrosion rate. The trend is okay, but uh, you can still can see the error, uh, uh, error range actually is big. And the solution pH model actually uh, relatively is not uh, so reliable based on the compare reason. And the, uh, the, the reason is I just mentioned, and the different uh, oil field and the different pipelines, the fluid chemistry and the operating condition may be different. So if we, can sim if we just uh, simplify the solution chemistry condition, then the pH prediction will be very different. So that's the direct reason you can see when we use the water chemistry model for corrosion prediction, actually we have to be very careful because a little bit of difference of the solution chemistry will cause a change of a pH and then to cause a difference of the corrosion rate. So that's the second type of the model for internal corrosion prediction. But my comments is this model, uh, we have to be very careful to control the solution chemistry condition very, very carefully. So the last model is very complicated, but it's very level. Because uh, for internal corrosion to happen, based on the fundamental understanding, you can say internal corrosion actually involved in multiple steps. It's involved mass transfer in the fluid. We need to include the fluid hydrodynamics model. Actually, there is iron carbonate scale formed on the steel surface. And we also need to include the iron carbonate into the model. Finally, when corrosion happen, we also have a different anodic and cathodic reactions happening on the steel surface. So that's why we also need to include the corrosion sum model. So if you want to uh, understand the corrosion and the model the internal corrosion, and actually all of them happen at the same time. But if we want to include all the sum models and together, and you will realize it's complicated. There are so many parameters will influence the corrosion process. And uh, I will say it's almost impossible for you to use the hand to calculate the influence of so many factors and on the corrosion rate. So that's why we need a computer to support us. Based on the compilation of so many models in the internal corrosion process, and we also develop the finite element model based on the software and the computational ability to calculate so many parameters and, the, and then influence the corrosion rate. And the computation time depends on the complexity of the corrosion system, usually is long. And, but uh, this model, because it includes so many parameters, so many different steps, is supposed to give you a reasonable prediction. So for example, if we input and uh, this uh, parameter into the model, and you can see the model can uh, deliver uh, many useful information, including the corrosion rate, uh, corrosion potential, anodic and cathodic reaction, and uh, how the corrosion current distributed on the steel surface. And of course, depends on the different parameter, different parameter. And uh, uh, okay, so, and uh, uh, it's also time 
And I will try to uh, quickly conclude my talk. So based on today's talk, you can see, and for industry to manage the internal corrosion problem, and firstly, we need to know and the internal corrosion. And then based on the fundamental knowledge, and we can design and develop the management strategy. So the management strategy actually, and for the modeling part, actually have the two important function. One, the model will help you to locate the corrosion location. So for the long distance pipeline, where is the most possible location for corrosion to happen? So the internal corrosion supposed to have this function. Second, when you locate the corrosion area, what is the corrosion rate? Particularly, what is the pitting corrosion rate? So that's a second function and uh, uh, developed based on the model. Then this model will in, uh, incorporate it with the ICDA program and uh, try to improve step-by-step -step your management program. For industry to manage and control the internal corrosion, based on my introduction today, and I know the company usually depends on the inhibitor and the biocide to control corrosion and the microbial corrosion. So based on my today's introduction, and uh, you will expect inhibitor and the biocide may not always useful. The reason is the deposit will block and uh, your inhibitor and the biocide and the touch the steel surface. At the same time, the inhibitor will compete with the other species and uh, attach it on the steel surface. So that's why the chemical treatment program may not always useful. So that's an experience in Canadian industry. So instead, the industry can depend on periodical picking and internal cleaning to remove the deposit and the snarch and the bell film. So this one will remove the internal corrosive environment. So this one is relatively useful for corrosion control. Okay, so finally, and uh, I want to thank again the Aberdeen branch to organize this event and also uh, have this opportunity to communicate with all of you. And uh, I also thank you very much for your attention. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dad. Professor Cheng, that was a very good presentation and very insightful. Uh, we're now going to do a Q&A session. So if anyone has any questions that they would like to ask uh, Professor Chen, please type them in the Q&A uh, tab and we'll get to them shortly. And uh, we already have some questions here, so we'll start straight away. Um, the first three are from uh, the same individual and they all relate to top of line corrosion. So I'll just read it out now. Um, it starts, um, hi, I'm interested to know more about top of line corrosion. I agree there are many factors as mentioned by Dr. Chen that contribute to the internal top of line corrosion. My question is, with the presence of volatile acetic acid, CO2 and well H2S, has Dr. Chen done any studies on top of line corrosion and any corrosion models, um, have any corrosion models been developed? Okay, uh, thank you very much for this question. Uh, I think the question was read by mood, right? Okay. Uh, top of line corrosion is a very typical corrosion type and uh, uh, you can experience in the lateral gas pipelines. And I think you know the, the reason very clearly because the water condensation formed on the uh, top actually also formed on the side of the pipe because the temperature difference between inside and outside. So when CO2 H2S dissolved in the water and it will cause a corrosion. So if you want to add the uh, inhibitor, but the inhibitor cannot reach the top of the water or side of water. So that's cause the corrosion and the leaking of the pipelines. So I think you know the reason and the background very well. Okay, for the uh, uh, model first, for the modeling first, because I do lots of model. For the modeling first, and uh, to model the top of line uh, internal corrosion, the very important things and uh, is firstly uh, have a couple of steps. The first important uh, uh, step is to try to simulate and the given condition mainly is a temperature and uh, how the water condensate will be formed on the top of the line. So the how the water condensate is formed is means what? Means the water thickness, okay? Water thickness. So this one depends on the fluid flow uh, I mean the lateral gas through the flow also depends on the temperature difference. Okay, after you determine 
the thickness of the water condensate. The second step, you need to think about the desorption of CO2 or H2S in the water. So this second step is to determine the water chemistry and the solution pH. So we can calculate based on the uh, partial pressure of CO2 and based on the uh, temperature and the pressure, we can calculate. So that's the second step. And the number three for the top of line corrosion modeling, and uh, we need to, uh, to think about and the given limited thickness of the water and the calculated water chemistry and the pH and how corrosion will make the corrosion product and the form and the deposit. So corrosion product have the two different functions. One is protect the corrosion. Second one will cause the localized corrosion and the deposit. So we need to balance the situation. So this depends on the structure of the uh, of the deposit of the pro uh, corrosion permanence. So that's a basically three uh, steps. And uh, uh, we try to understand or study the top of nine uh, uh, corrosion in the natural gas pipelines. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we'll move on to our next question, which is from uh, Siji. Um, how does one interpret the impedance graphs? Which curves indicate high corrosion rates relative to the others? Uh, so it may be worth getting those graphs on screen for clarity. Okay, so I just uh, quickly, because uh, uh, because of the limited time and also because the impedance is a, is kind of the complica uh, complicated technique, I just uh, quickly uh, answer this question. Firstly, the impedance graph can give you the mechanism of the corrosion reaction. So let's go back uh, to here. Okay. Uh, Okay, so please look at the impedance on the right side of the shared screen. And the, the shape of the impedance, if the impedance is the kind of the semicircle, it means the corrosion urinary is related to the charge transfer at the steel and the solution interface. It's a very simple situation. And uh, the size of the semicircle is uh, proportional related to the charge transfer resistance. Charge transfer resistance is how difficult the charge will go through and will exchange during corrosion reaction. So that's why the size of the semicircle will be proportional to the uh, corrosion rate. If the size is bigger, that means the corrosion rate is uh, faster. Corrosion rate is small, sorry, is small because the size is resistance, right? So if the, it's a bigger size semicircle, the corrosion rate is small, is low. So that's uh, from the shape and the size to determine the corrosion mechanism and the rate. The second, if the impedance is different geometry, for example, you can see the small impedance graph, there is a very small semicircle and behind, below the 0 0.01, uh, 0 0.05 hertz, right? So this one, you really can tell you two things. First one, your steel surface will experience some localized corrosion, make the surface become rough, increase the roughness. For example, and uh, in this case, I have the scale, but due to some reason, the scale is broken to form a corrosion piece. So this can cause the extra some circle here. So another reason, if you have the inhibitor added to the fluid, the inhibitor attach on the steel surface sometimes can also cause and the extra semicircle in this area. But to be briefly, the impedance can tell you some of the mechanism information can also help you to calculate the corrosion rate. And because it's a complicated technique and it's, <laughs> it's difficult to give the detailed comments about this one. I hope you, uh, you know something and uh, uh, you are okay with my answer in a very brief way. So, and uh, if the fluid is flowing, and uh, of course we can still measure impedance. The condition is when you put the steel in the flowing fluid, you have to wait until the corrosion is in the stable, uh, stable condition. So the indicator of the stable condition, you can measure the open circle potential or corrosion potential. If the potential is relatively stable, 
and you believe the corrosion uh, is going to the equilibrium condition, then you can start to measure. It's a low problem, okay, it's a low problem. Uh, how did you mount the electric internal surface? Okay, uh, I go to the here, quickly go to, oops, no, here. Okay, you can see the graph on the left side, and uh, this is a, a water loop in my lab, and this is a measurement segment, and uh, part of the, the sample here is attached as a part of the loop side on the surface. The, the loop is a circular, right, is a circular, and uh, we also try to make the uh, uh, surface and the sample holder with a, with a certain a curved shape and uh, try to fit and uh, the test the loop geometry. And uh, if the fluid is flowing and it's a flow through the surface of the sample. So that's how to install. I just quickly go into here. <clears throat> okay. Uh, thank you. Um, next question. Uh, how can we prevent microbial internal corrosion? Okay. And uh, right now in Canada, I believe in UK or other countries, and the biocide is a common method, and the chemistry or uh, chemical treatment program is very common and uh, to control corrosion, including the internal microbial corrosion. But uh, uh, based on my common knowledge and my interaction with the industry, the chemical treatment program is not always very useful. So, and based on my understanding, to be short, I think the periodical and the internal cleaning program can remove the biofilm from the internal surface of the, of the pipe. This is very effective to control the internal microbial corrosion, simply to remove the bioenvironment from the interior of the pipe. Okay. Thank, thank you very much for that. Okay, um, next question I have here is, why are many models concerned with sweet corrosion and why is sour corrosion less predictable? <laughs> okay, and uh, most of my research, yes, you are right. I focus on the sweet corrosion. And uh, for the sour corrosion, uh, my understanding have uh, two reasons. And uh, scientifically, the H2S and, uh, will a little bit more complicated and uh, in, ter in terms of the corrosion situation. And uh, H2S will influence the corrosion based on the change of pH and based on the formation of the iron sulfate scale. So this is pretty similar with the CO2 environment. But the H2S also have a unique feature and the H2S will promote the hydrogen evolution and the hydrogen permeation. So that's why when we talk about the soil corrosion, H2S environment, and we also need to pay attention about the cathodic hydrogen evolution because it will be caused, if it's go, significantly go into the steel, the hydrogen environment will be the consequence. And uh, so because it's related to the steel metallurgy and uh, not just from the uh, corrosion chemistry side. So that's why lots of model cannot predict from the two different the aspects but they both happen at the same time. That's the change corrosion and may cause the hydrogen burnment of the steel based on the improved hydrogen evolution. So that's a, a one of the reasons from the scientific perspective. The second reason, uh, everybody knows H2S is uh, very strictly regulated in the university or in the industry research organization. And uh, uh, in Canada, for example, in Alberta, for example, and a lot of many laboratory and agencies have the regulation and the permission and the capability to do the H2S uh, corrosion. So just the limited location can do the H2S. And so that's uh, probably also the reason and a lot of many results related to the H2S compared with the CO2. Yes, that's very true, very true. <laughs> Okay, um, next question I have here is, um, instead of partial pressure, why is fugacity um, considered in modeling? Any significance in prediction accuracy? Uh, yes, this is a very good question. It's uh, in most, uh, <clears throat> in most of the situation, we just uh, simply use the pressure <laughs> to just uh, quantify uh, for the gas phase, right? But uh, from the physical side, from the physical chemistry perspective, and uh, 
the the partial pressure under the uh, under the given condition is not accurate compared with the uh, fragility. And if you modify the gas species with a coefficient, so and uh, that's uh, if you want to develop a very accurate the chemistry model, the gas phase actually I suggest to use the coefficient to modify the pressure. For the concentration, that's the same thing. So mostly we need to quantify the chemicals use a concentration. But uh, if you want to improve the uh, accuracy of the model, and we don't use the concentration, but we use the activity to modify the concentration with the coefficient to calculate the activity. That's the same reason. That's the same reason. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. Okay, um, next one I have here is, um, how did you conduct the electrochemical experiments like EIS and PDP in the solution containing oil as it, interf as it interferes with the reliability of polarization results due to high resistance? Okay, very good question, thank you. And uh, if the oil concentration is high enough, and it really will influence the conductivity of the fluid. And in this way, the chemical, electrochemical measurements will not be reliable. So that's why I say it's a very good question. And uh, if you want to study the corrosion in oil system or in oil environment, and firstly, you have to and try to mix the oil and the water to form a emulsion, okay? To form a emulsion. And try to avoid the steel sam sample surface is whited by the oil. So if whited by the oil, electrochemical measurements does not apply. So try to mix the oil and the water into a emulsion. So that's a very critical. Okay, so that's the first thing. Second thing, if the oil concentration is high enough and make the conductivity going down significantly, and but you still, you believe corrosion is a problem. So yes, it really is a, potentially is a problem because water still exists. In this case, you can add some support and the chemicals. So the support chemicals such as the sodium ions will increase the conductivity, but will not influence the corrosion reaction. So that's a something and uh, we, we can also do if the oil is a significantly, significantly high concentration. <clears throat> Thank you very much for that clarification. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, one, one more question here. Uh, for the experimental assessments done in the loop, were the assessed velocities assumed to correlate to laminar flow regimes? Okay, a uh, lot just the laminar flow region and also include the uh, tubular. So uh, flow velocity, okay, that's good. We use this uh, slide. And uh, the laminar or tubular fluid condition depends on the flow velocity and also depends on the pipe size. And uh, uh, of course, the uh, viscosity and the uh, uh, density of the fluid. So it depends on many different parameters. So, and uh, in our research, use the flow loop, we try to simulate the both conditions. And uh, in this condition, you can say uh, if the flow velocity is 0 0.25 meter per second, it's relatively no flow velocity. And we can calculate the real lunar number and to determine this is a laminar. But if we increase the 1.5 and use the small size of the uh, loop and it can translate into the turbulent. So that's a loop. And if we want to improve the fluid velocity, you can see these slides, we can also perform the uh, impingement or internal corrosion using the impingement jet. So this one has the capability to increase the flow velocity uh, is not shown here. So the impingement jet can raise up with the flow velocity to five meter per second. And in this case, it's 100% is a turbulent flow. So that's why for your question, we need to simulate both and try to understand how, to, how the fluid flow influences corrosion. Thanks again. Okay, um, let's, we'll just do two more and then we'll wrap it up. So um, okay. penultimate question, uh, for MIC, according to your experience and study, is the level of bacterial a factor in determining the susceptibility to failure slash corrosion rates? Is there a threshold for bacterial level, e.g. SRB, before MIC could lead to a corrosion issue? Okay, so and uh, from the industrial management purpose, this is a great question. 
And uh, my experience and for MIC is uh, the level of bacteria is an important factor. And uh, if you, for example, uh, we do have the results for the given sample, we see the increased quantity of the bacteria cells, SRB cells on the surface. We use the biotesting, use a, a laser reservation a microscope to quantify how many SRB cells are touching on the cell surface. We do have the correlation. When the uh, SRB cell going up, the quantity going up, the corrosion rate will going up. But uh, there is a, a, a saturation level. So if all the surface is uh, saturated with SRB and the corrosion rate change will be uh, become stable uh, study condition. So in terms of the threshold and of the bacteria cell to cause a corrosion, uh, right now, I don't know there is any threshold uh, level uh, correlate the quantity of the cells with the corrosion initiation. So right now, I don't know the certain uh, answer because you say one or two or 100. Uh, it seems to me, I have to say this kind of the uh, publication or report uh, for this kind of the question. But I believe this is a very good question. And probably we will work in the future try to determine the threshold level of the cell quantity and to initiate the corrosion on the steel. Yeah, we don't have these results right now. Thank, thanks again. Okay, um, last, last question um, from Peter Brown. Do you believe sodium sulfide provides a good simulation for H2S during LPR testing? Uh, uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, it's also a great question. And uh, you ask me, uh, I think it's, uh, you ask the right person <laughs> because I do have a publication and to compare, we use the sodium sulfide compare with SRB and to compare the corrosion. My answer is low, <laughs> unfortunately. And uh, we cannot use the uh, uh, sodium sulfide to simulate SRB to do the MIC research. The reason is uh, doing the SRB included in the environment the bioactivity will be quite different if you just simply use an uh, inorganic chemical to simulate the uh, uh, sulfate chemical level. So that's a totally different. And uh, the major difference is a two aspect. One is the average corrosion rate. So SRB included in the system, the average corrosion rate under the same condition, same steel, will be higher compared with the sodium sulfide. And in terms, you simulate the same pH level. The second thing is a major difference. SRB will cause the faster pitting corrosion rate. That's a localized corrosion rate. So that's why my answer is no, you cannot use the sodium sulfide to simulate SRB. So if you are interested, I can send you the published paper and to give you the detailed comparison and for the corrosion simulation. That's, that's great to know. So, so again, um, if anyone has any further questions or would like to um, get any further information from uh, Professor Chen on his, on his work, uh, you're, you're free to contact him directly. And yeah. uh, again, if you have any data you wish, yeah. yes, contact emails there on the last slide, um, fcheng at usecalgary.ca. Um, and again, if you'd like to collaborate with him, I, you'll find that very useful uh, having that uh, industry knowledge. All right, thank you very much. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ole, for the questions. And thanks again, uh, Dr. Cheng, for this excellent presentation and a very, very interesting topic uh, based on the number of questions we receive. And a few uh, comments and thanks uh, in the chat box. Uh, uh, really enjoyed uh, this this talk. Thank you very much. Uh, so thanks everyone for taking the time uh, attending uh, this evening uh, presentation, and I hope that you find it of benefit. Uh, once you uh, leave this the webinar, there will be a short survey that uh, please uh, I am asking you to to fill that. Uh, if especially if you need a CPT certificate, please uh, tick the box uh, there. And also, if you are interested to know more about the Young Engineer uh, program, uh, there is a section in the survey that you can uh, mention about your question or your interest uh, to participate. 
and as I mentioned, the, the recording will be available on the YouTube and the slides uh, PDF version uh, will be available on the website. Uh, and the next uh, month's program, quickly, I will show it on the screen. It's, uh, is, it, is it showing on the screen, uh, Oli? Uh, yes, it's up. Yeah. Yes, it's up. Okay. So it's a joint uh, webinar with ION3 uh, on 30th of November, uh, Tuesday, last Tuesday of the month. Uh, uh, you will receive the flyer later on, then the, the link to follow uh, for the uh, registration. Uh, that's by Dr. Nigel Owen from uh, Aberdeen Foundries. Uh, that's about sacrificial anode material specification, manufacturing, and design. Uh, uh, another good uh, and interesting uh, topic uh, for November, which will be our last uh, uh, webinar of the, this year uh, until the, no, January that we continue with the next one. Uh, thanks again and have a good rest of the day or evening. Thank you, Homer. Thank you very much, Dr. Yeah, Cheng. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, bye-bye. Yeah, thanks a lot. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.